Hi, and uh, welcome to week two. Uh, I want to spend my video blog today walking you through three different things. One, I want us to look back and look at the exercise that you've just completed, a little bit of what we've uh, explored in week one. Uh, I want to look forward to the final project and just talk to you a little bit about that. And I want to spend some time talking about the next 24 hours as we dig into the Mean Girls case. So uh, first, why don't I just start with the Mean Girls case and say that um, as you explore this case, um, I think that you're going to find a lot of elements that you're familiar with. And you'll notice that in my instructions for the discussion board, I've been uh, very explicit about asking you to not just respond to your own you know, experience and gut instinct and what that's telling you as you learn more about this situation, but also to look at uh, things like frame theory or schema theory or decision-making theory and, and choose one of those lenses or multiple lenses to help guide how you think about this case. And, you know, I know a lot of times in an academic environment, you, you get exposed to theory and you're asked to apply it to practice, and it's not really clear what good that does you, you know, what the value of it is. But, but I want you to know that in, in the experience I've had with students uh, over what is now 20 years of, of teaching at leadership classes, uh, and I, I, by the way, I do catch my breath a little bit when I say that number. It seems impossible, but, uh, but that's, that's the number. So uh, what I've learned is that uh, my students, of all the different theories that we've touched on when it comes to dealing with ethical issues, these three in particular have been really valuable to them. In other words, they've reported back to me that these are actually living, breathing, theoretical frames that they find themselves falling back on. Uh, in the field later, and that they help them uh, develop lenses to see things. And they're nimble, meaning that they, they can easily be drawn on and they can be applied to a lot of different contexts. Uh, and, and I think that they, they can be very effective. And so uh, we're, pra we're practicing that. Uh, we're trying those on for size. And for those of you who will take me in other classes, uh, you'll find that some of these I, I pull on um, at a variety of different times through different classes. Uh, for example, frames theory, uh, when I teach the schools and uh, organization class uh, in the fall, uh, I, I, we rely on that very heavily. So, so that's, that's my thinking. That's why I'm doing what I'm doing. Uh, I do think that it has a lot of practical value. It's not just an academic exercise. Um, looking backwards, uh, I've really enjoyed reading uh, part one of the assignment. I realized as I did a count that in my career I've read uh, between 500 and 600 of these interviews, uh, and I never grow tired of them. Uh, I learn a lot from them, and the reason I assign those is because I'm trying to give you an opportunity to have a face-to-face -face conversation with somebody about what is very difficult to talk about, uh, which is moral failure or, or moral difficulties, and I think it's, it's hard to approximate that in a discussion board, and so giving you the opportunity to have that interaction I'm hoping will be uh, a source of inspiration for reflection as you look at your own moral failures moving into the final assignment. The one thing I want to reiterate, and I, I've, this has come up before in class, but for me and for the purpose of this class, a moral failure is nothing more than a time in which you knew what the right thing to do was and you did something else. It doesn't matter what the outcome was. It doesn't matter if it ended in a very positive way or not. It's simply that an issue of integrity between what you decided was right and what you actually followed through with. Uh, well, that's all I have for the blog today. Um, looking forward to seeing you online.